Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It sounds to me like we don't have very much volume. How does it sound to you? Terrible. Terrible. There's a thing down here marked volume. Let us see what happens. This man is, has worked in the radio field for years. Good dead. <laughs> That's live. We're in business? I think so. He's earning his money early, isn't he? <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Did you ever lean on a weak reed or feel that you were taking a step uh, whose exact uh, next foundation you were not quite sure of? I resent that. <laughs> Those remarks have nothing to do with our speaker, and I am going to try to, to quell his resentment as quickly as I can by assuring him that this is in no way intended to be a comment directly addressed to him or to his sterling qualities as a speaker. Rather, to uh, a somewhat unnerving discovery I made while having dinner with him with a small group of people just a short time ago. I was given some biographical information about our speaker, David Schoenbrunn, which uh, I had reason, or at least hope, to believe was fairly current. And I discovered, uh, thank goodness, in the course of questioning him at the dinner that uh, some of the information was no longer accurate. So I want you to know, this is a sort of a caveat at the very beginning, I want you to know that what will follow here is in part from this perhaps somewhat shaky document that I was given. Old FBI report. An old FBI report, he says. No CIA activity. And uh, also, from some of the information that I got from him at dinner. All right. One thing I think I can say without fear of contradiction, and that is that if you want to find a word to suit uh, our speaker tonight, versatile would be a word that would work rather well. David Schoenbrunn has been reporting and broadcasting and writing about national and world affairs for over three decades now. More about that later on. But what strikes you when you do look through any kind of a pamphlet or a biographical sketch which gives his background, what strikes you is that he has won high professional honors in just about every major field of communications. Radio, television, newspapers, magazines, books, the lecture platform, and yes, in the classroom too. He is senior lecturer at the New School for Social Research in New York and has been a member of the Graduate Seminar of Columbia University. If you look at just some of the awards he's been given during the last 20 years, you see they range from the overseas press clubs, best, sporting, best reporting from abroad laurels in both radio and television, to the DuPont Award as the best television commentator of the year, and honors for one year's best book on foreign affairs, another year's best magazine article of the year, to at least a half dozen university and organization awards in the fields of journalism and public affairs. He's the author of at least four major books. Uh, that number may be conservatively stated. And the most recent is one that is just about to come into your hands. It's Ben Franklin in Paris, to be published October 20th, I believe, by Harper and Row. Now, David Schoenbrunn was the first commentator for the Voice of America after Pearl Harbor. During World War II, he served as intelligence officer for General Eisenhower in North Africa and Europe. He was the chief correspondent for CBS News in Paris and Washington for almost 20 years. During World War II, he was reported to be the first American soldier to reach the Rhine River as the American armies advanced into Germany. In one of the later wars, after the French had decorated him with the Croix de Guerre and the Legion of Honor, in one of the later wars that our generation has had the singular misfortune to have so many of, uh, he was able to cover the historic battle of Dien Bien Phu, the final blow for the French, you'll recall, in Vietnam. That, of course, was before the United States decided to show the French how it really should have been done, how you really win a war over there. Mr. Schoenbrunn was the only American correspondent actually inside that garrison at that turning point battle that signaled the French defeat in Southeast Asia. After leaving CBS, he became chief correspondent for Metro Media News, the news division of one of the country's major independent group ownerships of radio and television stations. He has been with the ABC television organization since that time. And now he tells me he spends about a third of his time equally divided among writing, books, and other forms of writing, uh, acting as an academic, teaching at the New School for Social Research in New York City, 
and making speeches all over the country and indeed in other parts of the world as well. So you can see whether all of my reliable uh, information was quite as reliable as I at first had assumed it to be, you can see very clearly that our speaker this evening is both a highly professional and richly experienced news reporter, he's also a serious scholar and a veteran analyst of national and foreign affairs. He has years of on-the-scene knowledge based on personal observations made in Europe, the Orient, and America. He is a man who doesn't hesitate to say how he feels and express his opinions very vividly and very precisely. I think you're going to find that it's as great a pleasure for you as it has been for me to present him to hear Mr. David Schoenbrunn. David? Thank you, Jack. That was very nice. I really am a splendid fellow. <laughs> you had everything exactly correct. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. To the gentlemen, I'm very pleased to see you. To the ladies, you know that I lust after all of you in my heart. <laughs> I do know that God will forgive me, but my wife has informed me that she will not. <laughs> my wife is my God. My holy scripture is the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which is the subject of tonight's meeting that we're holding. And I want to talk to you about that. But first, I want to tell you I'm very, very happy to be back on the campus of Iowa State. I was here last after I came out of Hanoi. I was the first American radio and television man. You missed that. That's right. You missed that. <laughs> to enter North Vietnam in the course of the American War, an extraordinary experience being bombed by my own troops. It was awful being on route number one and seeing the planes come overhead and waving my fist and saying, you son, and then realizing they were my soldiers. It's a schizophrenic experience. But it wasn't the first time that happened in my life because when I was in the Siegfried line, a brave Air Force, which was supposed to clear the way for us infantry, arrived two hours late and bombed us. So I've been bombed twice by the American Army once in the same battle and once in an opposition battle. I'm glad to be back here because actually I first came to Ames in 1952. I want to tell you about that because it's the reason that I'm here tonight. You have a marvelous woman living in your community. She's sitting over there. She's going to be very annoyed with me for saying this. It's Emily Riker. And last year, I was a professor on an educational cruise in the Caribbean, and Emily, was on the ship. And I was doing a course of political science. I was teaching about American science, political science. And I was talking about America. And I explained to them that I was an urban fellow, born and brought up in New York. And that my first experience with anything outside of New York came in 1952. I'd been the Paris correspondent of CBS. And Eisenhower was the candidate. And I'd been an officer on Eisenhower's staff, was a close friend of Ike's, so CBS asked me to come home and accompany Eisenhower and to be their correspondent on the Eisenhower train. And I was explaining this to my class. And I had a cultural shock. And the cultural shock almost cost me my job in CBS. Uh, it was very interesting because, as I told you, I'm a very urban fellow. And I'd worked for many years in Paris after being born and raised in New York. And I flew directly from Paris, France, to Abilene, Kansas. I'm going to tell you that's going downhill very rapidly. <laughs> and I had to do a broadcast in Abilene early in that morning. And the night before, I played poker all night long with Ed Morrow and Bob Considine and Scotty Rest in the New York Times. And we'd forgotten that Abilene was not at the same time as New York. So when I thought it was 6 o'clock in the morning, it was, in fact, 7 o'clock in the morning. And I had two and a half minutes to make a broadcast. I had no script. And I ran as fast as I could from our poker game to the studio and got there just as the announcer was saying, hopefully, and here now is David Schoenbrunn. And as he said it, I sat down. I had no script. I had no idea what to say. And I decided I would just tell the truth about how I felt at that moment. And I, and I said on national network radio, ladies and gentlemen, this is David Schoenbrunn reporting from Abilene, Kansas. Nowhere in the world can one see so far and so little. <laughs> came very close to ending my career as the telephone calls from Kansas piled into CBS. From there, we went on a train, whistle stop, to Ames, Iowa. By then, I was a little more cautious in my comments 
about the great plains and prairie states of the United States of America. And I must tell you quite honestly, and, and Emily is a witness to this, that I was very impressed by Ames. I got off the train and there was a big party and um, a fish fry and uh, corn all over the place. And that was before hybrid corn, so the corn was really as high as the elephant's eye. And I never saw such corn in my life, in every sense of the word. <laughs> but I saw very, very beautiful, healthy young women and young men. And I thought that they were vital, and I listened to the speeches, and they were very decent people, and they were church going, and they believed in America. And I first, for the first time as a cynical New Yorker, I understood the expression of heartland America. And I was very deeply impressed by Ames, Iowa, and the decency and the good health that I saw all around me, and some extremely intelligent speeches. And I met members of your faculty and was very impressed by their quality. Now, I must tell you that I made this speech somewhere in the Caribbean Sea, coming off the coast of Martinique. And when my class finished, a student in my class came over to me and said, I was very impressed by what you had to say about Ames, Iowa. She said, my name's Emily Reiki, I'm a corn farmer, and I come from Ames, Iowa. Can you imagine that on this educational cruise for the New School for Social Research, right out in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, there's this corn farmer who doesn't look anything like a corn farmer at all. And, and Emily said, that's wonderful, David. She said, I'm going to arrange for you to come to Iowa State and talk there again. So when you're furious with me before the evening is over, don't argue with me. Go talk to Emily Riker. She's sitting, Emily, stand up and take a bow. <laughs> Now, the last time I was here, about eight years ago, after Hanoi, I spoke about the war in Vietnam. And some of you remember that I was the very, very first American to oppose the war in Vietnam. In fact, I opposed the war in Vietnam before Americans even knew what Vietnam was. I opposed the war in Vietnam when it broke out in 1946. As Jack said so intelligently, we Americans decided to show the French how that war could be won. You all know what happened. But I gave a report here on this campus of my trip through Vietnam, of my interview with Ho Chi Minh. I made a prediction on this campus in 1968 that the war was lost, that it made no sense, and I was very roundly criticized, and that was another point in my career in which I had very great difficulties. I'm very happy to be back tonight to talk about the First Amendment because all of these things are very deeply related. What I said about Abilene, which caused me great grief, and what I said about Vietnam, in 68, which caused me great grief, led me to understand that all Americans are not in favor of the First Amendment to the Constitution. I believe that if the Bill of Rights was submitted to a national referendum today, that it probably wouldn't pass. I believe that America's faith in democracy has been severely weakened. And I want to talk to you about that tonight because I think the only solution is going to have to come from you from your generation, because my generation, I think, has lost its, uh, its spirit and its bearings. And I think the only answer to the deterioration and erosion of democratic spirit in this country has to come through educational forums. One of the things that I feel most strongly as a professor of government is that we teach courses on Marxism, on socialism, on Buddhism, on comparative religions, on everything except democracy. In our colleges today, we have courses, to be sure, on what is called political science, which is a misnomer for it is not scientific at all. Let's call it government, which is a more classic name for it. But we give courses on the Constitution. We give courses on political parties. But we don't give a course on the meaning, nature, function of democracy. And democracy is, in my view, an endangered species in the world today. There are 150 some odd nations in the United Nations, and perhaps a couple of dozen more who were not in, let's say, 175 organized nations in the world today, of which, at best, of the 175 nations, only 20, only 20, might be described as in some way or other democratic. Only 12 which follow a truly democratic system. What is the essence of democracy? The true essence of a democratic system is the free people freely choosing its own government at moments of its own choice. 
And I would say no more than 12 or 14 countries do that. So we, as Democrats, are a minority in the world, and we are a shrinking minority. I think one reason for that is continued and growing government control of speech and of press. For basically, basically, if democracy is the free election of governments, the free election of governments depends upon a free press. Thomas Jefferson said, if I have to choose between a free government and a free press, I will always choose a free press. For without a free press, one cannot have a free government. That's what Thomas Jefferson said. I don't know how many people in the country today or even in this room today would make the same statement. I think the free press is under very severe attack and has been since the days of Spiro Agnew. It has, of course, earlier in American life from John Adams on sporadically be under, been under attack. But in our immediate times, since Spiro Agnew's attack upon the press, I believe that the American faith in a free press, or even the American determination to have a free press, is now seriously eroded. And I wouldn't venture to say what the percentage is, but although a great many Americans still believe in the necessity for a free press, I think many more believe in restraints upon the press. Let us examine some cases in history, and the most recent one, which is the most important one, and the one which I know most about. And that is the case of Daniel Shore. The case of Jan Daniel Shore involves many delicate and intriguing questions of law, of politics, and of ethics. Now, in his case, there have been two principal elements among many nuances, but there are two elements that you must understand in the case of Daniel Shore and the Congress of the United States. One is a reporter's right to keep confidential the identity of his news source. In this case, the Pike Committee had prepared a report on the activities of the CIA, and I'll go into that in great detail with you. And that report was published by Dan Shore. And the Ethics Committee of the House called him in and asked him to reveal to them the man or woman who had given him that document. And he refused to answer. So that one element is a correspondence refusal to identify a news source when questioned by an official agency of the United States government. That's one element. The other element, which is fascinating and perhaps even more important, is the right of a given agency of the United States government to mark one of its reports as secret and not for public consumption. I intend to discuss both of these elements fully with you and to give you my own point of view on them, admitting to you that it's highly controversial and that there are two very distinct schools of thought. One holding that government must have its secrets if it is to exist. Even Arthur Schlesinger, a liberal, the head of the Americans for Democratic Action, has stated over and over again that there is not possible for government to function unless it can maintain its secrets. I have to disagree with Arthur Schlesinger on this point, but I want you to know that serious men, scholars of American history, liberals, not just conservatives or reactionaries, believe that there is some validity to the argument about government secrecy. I hold a different view. I think there's very little validity to government secrecy, but I admit that in this case, I'm in the minority. I really appreciate the opportunity of explaining my views to you. Hope you will listen. And then, of course, I hope we're going to have a very full discussion when I finished, because I'm most eager to have question and answer period with you, because I know I've got a lot to learn from you. And I have to find out as a reporter what my country and my countrymen are thinking. My country women, too, I hasten to add, are thinking. So I will discuss that the right of secrecy and the right of confidentiality of a source. But before I do that, I think it's most important that we review the facts about which there is no controversy whatsoever, to review the facts of the Daniel Shore case. Daniel Shore case started about a year ago. It grew out of the fact that the House of Representatives authorized the committee headed by Congressman Pike authorized that committee to investigate the activities 
of the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, and to investigate in general covert activities of the American intelligence community. Now, I insist upon the fact that it was the House of Representatives that, oh, there's no argument about this, that authorized this committee to draw up that report and that provided a very important budget of several hundred thousand dollars for the purpose of drafting such a report. Now, I suggest to you, my fellow citizens of the United States of America, that the House of Representatives is supposed to be what its name states it to be, representatives of whom? Of you and me. They're representing us. When they vote a budget of 200,000 some odd dollars, that's not their money. It's not the government's money. Make no mistake about that. It's your money and my money. Probably a lot more money of mine than of yours because I earn more money than you do. <laughs> so maybe I feel more deeply about it. Shortly, you will all be earning more money. And you will feel deeply about this too. But believe me, it's not money that motivates me. There's a very important principle that motivates me as a free American citizen. My representatives in Congress assembled financed by me with my mandate and yours to represent us is looking into the affairs of the United States government to see whether government agencies serving us have carried out their mandate legitimately and legally in the service of democracy and the moral revolution that the United States of America represents in the world. I think that's a fair statement to make on this bicentennial year, what the American Revolution is all about and the fundamental purposes of the American Constitution and the American democratic polity. Now, these men <coughs> spent many, many, many months holding hearings, gathering testimony, sending out their investigative aides and agents to look through the records of the CIA to accumulate information of the behavior of a vital agency of the United States government who, it was suspected, had been guilty of illegal and improper actions in the name of the American people. Now, Jack, is this not something that the American people is entitled to know? We've not only paid for it, I don't want to be too vulgar about it, we've mandated it politically, quite apart from the fact that we've paid for it. That report belonged to the American people. And there's no argument about this in my mind. Congress is not a secret agency of the United States government. Congress is the house of the people. If the people are, in fact, governing this country through their consent, <coughs> mandating their representatives, then this report belonged to the people of the United States. Not only do I say this, but I must tell you, the members of the Pike Committee said this. That is what, to me, is so fascinating about the story. The Pike Committee finished its report and announced, to nobody's astonishment, that it would be made public. Well, why shouldn't it be made public? It was the public's business. It was your right to know what the CIA did in your name. That is what distinguishes us from the Soviet Union, from China, from Uganda, and from other undemocratic governments, which feel no obligation to inform their citizens, which does not serve its citizens, but serves only a totalitarian state. We are not. Thank God, not yet, anything like a totalitarian state. Despite all of the imperfections of our society, we do remain the world's greatest democracy. Well, maybe I'm overstating the case. Maybe I ought to put it in terms of Winston Churchill, who said America is not the world's best democracy. It is the world's least bad form of government. <laughs> it's pretty bad. But if you travel the world, as I travel the world, you would know 
that your form of government is the least bad in the world, and in many cases our form of government, God bless it, is pretty good. That does not include the CIA. <laughs> not a, which is not a form of government, which is an agency of government badly needing of overhauling. And this, by the way, is what the Pike Committee discovered. The Pike Committee discovered many other fascinating things, which I could have told them before they investigated, like Henry Kissinger is a liar. <laughs> I've known that for years. <laughs> Took them nine months to find it out. Henry Kissinger said he never wiretapped his associates in relation to the secret bombing of Cambodia. By the way, there's another beautiful government secret. The government did not want you to know that we were bombing Cambodia on the basis of national security. It was a national security secret. Like if they told you, then the people of Cambodia would discover for the first time that they were being bombed. <laughs> Unbelievable. You think I'm, I'm, I'm joking. That's exactly what they said. You mustn't reveal to the enemy what we're doing. Don't tell them that we're bombing Cambodia because they don't know. I thought I'd lose my wit. I lost my hair from frequent pulling over my years as a correspondent. Now, I've reached the point in my narrative where the Pike Committee has finished its report on the intelligence community and has announced that it's being printed and was going to be published there. So what does my friend Dan Shore do? You know, Dan and I worked for 18 years together in CBS. I was the Paris correspondent, he was sometimes the Moscow correspondent, sometimes the Bonn correspondent in Germany. A marvelous, brilliant correspondent. We were competing all the time to see who could break what story first. I admired Dan Shore enormously. And then Dan Shore was finally brought back to Washington. This is after I had already left Washington. And Dan, like a damn good reporter, hearing that this committee's report was going to be published, decided that he was going to publish it before anybody else. That's the spirit of enterprise. Now look here. I frankly don't admire that very much. I must tell you the truth. And, and I was talking to journalism students this afternoon. Some of you may be here today. I don't think that being first is all that damned important. Um, commercially it is. You know, your organization can boast we had a scoop. I think what's important is being accurate, being reliable, being honest, and being complete. That's what's important to me as a reporter. I'm sure Jack's felt that way as a news director over the years. Yet, Jack, how many times were you tempted to be first? You know, so was I. So Dan Shore wanted to be first. Okay, that's, that's part of my more race, isn't it? part of the repertorial syndrome. So what does Dan do? Dan's got a lot of sources in Washington, knows a lot of people. They respect him. They know he's a darn good reporter. So Dan goes around to see him and says, hey, who's got a copy of the Pike Report? So some friend of his who liked Dan, probably won some money from him at poker and wanted to pay him back. That happens often in Washington. I got a lot of scoops because I was a good poker player myself. Gave Dan the report. I asked you. Anything wrong with that? Pike Committee finished the report? They said they were going to publish the report? So somebody gave it to Dan first. Terrible. Nobody, as a matter of fact, nobody even thought twice about it. And this is what you must know about the Shore Report, which was not published in the press. The press hasn't done its job. It doesn't even defend its own freedoms. That's the worst thing about the press today, that it doesn't even stand up for itself. That's why democracy is eroding. Why, when Dan was in trouble, the Correspondence Committee on Freedom of the Press wouldn't even support Dan Shore. I'm heartily ashamed of my own profession. If we don't defend ourselves, who in the world is going to defend us? Well, what happened is that Dan got a copy of this report. Now, here is the sweetest part of the story for me. Dan got it, rushed to CBS management, to his news director, Jack, and said, Jack, I got the report. And they said, terrific. Let's get it on the air right away. So Dan did, listen to me, 15 broadcasts over two days. 
15 broadcasts about the Pike Committee report, giving the essential details about the misdeeds of the CIA. Not one word of complaint from the Congress of the United States. Not a word. Now, what I'm telling you is not arguable. I'm giving you facts. Why should there have been a complaint? Pike Committee said it was going to publish it. There are no restrictions upon it, even agreeing that restrictions can be put upon it, which I'm coming to. Dan Mealy, through journalistic enterprise, got it first, put it out. Please note this, put it out without any complaint against them. What happened then? Next step in this mysterious case of Daniel Shore and the Congress of the United States. Some reactionaries in the House, and boy, there's plenty of them, were contacted by the CIA and the FBI and representatives of President Candidate Ford. And our present candidate for election sent his aides out and asked the House, the full House, to overrule the Pike Committee and to keep the CIA report secret. Mr. Ford was defending this agency under his control, which he knew had been guilty of serious misdeeds. Now, I'm talking about the First Amendment tonight. I'm not talking about Mr. Ford. I'm not getting involved in politics tonight, although I desperately want to. <laughs> and all I can say to you is that when I have finished, I invite questions, not only on the First Amendment, <laughs> Any questions you might like to ask about anything, particularly the election campaign? Because I'm kind of steamed up about the election. I may be the only person in the whole country who's steamed up about the election campaign, but I am. And by God, when I leave here tonight, I want to make sure that whoever you vote for, that you vote. I have broken my back to get the vote for young people of America, and if you don't vote, you stink. You're not worth a damn if you don't vote. Furthermore, if you don't vote, our country's finished. But I'm going to come to that later. That's not part of tonight's presentation. <laughs> that was a parenthetical observation which I could not keep down. To get back to Daniel Shaw and the House. The House, under intense pressure from the CIA and the White House, voted to keep the Pike Committee report secret. Ladies and gentlemen, I see, this is a fact. Now, what I'm about to say is an argument, not a fact. You may even disagree with it. I think it is a disgrace, a disgrace, that the House of Representatives should vote to deny the American people the information in a report on an agency of the American government, which you're entitled to know about. And to call it national security is as phony and as fraudulent as Mr. Nixon's fraudulent complaint that the investigation into Watergate was national security. National security is invoked by members of our government every time they want protection from the mistakes that they make. And they tell you that there are secrets that they must have to keep our nation secure. And if those secrets come out, Russia and China are going to be in Trenton, New Jersey tomorrow. Now, the truth of the matter of fact is that nobody wants to be in Trenton, New Jersey. <laughs> in fact, every day by the hundreds, people are leaving Trenton, New Jersey. No Russian or Chinese in his right mind would go to Trenton, New Jersey. Just as Lyndon Johnson told you, if you don't stop those little Vietnamese in their black pajamas, they'll be landing in Malibu Beach. I never understood how they were going to get to Malibu Beach crossing the Pacific apparently in wooden dugout canoes since the Vietnamese never had a navy. But that's the sort of pap and junk and punk that the government has fed the American people for much too long a time. However, I mix fact and argument, but I want to label both. Fact, the House voted to keep it secret. Argument, I think it was disgraceful. Now comes another argument. Did the House have the right to classify this material as secret? 
The answer to that is the house can do anything it pleases about its own business. That's true. Now comes another question. Does a reporter, and you listen to this question carefully because you're going to face this many times in your future lives as participating citizens of the United States for many years to come. You're the generation. You know that's going to be in power in the 21st century. And if there is, go I'm not, I'm going to be long gone. Good luck to you. <laughs> if there's going to be democracy in the 21st century, it's going to depend upon how you answer you. Questions of this kind, I'm talking to you about something really, a gut relationship between you and issues. Should a reporter accept a House ruling on secrecy? My argument is not at all. Absolutely not. The Constitution of the United States, about which you have heard since public school and high school and in college and in all of your government classes and civics classes, says simply what everybody knows, Congress shall pass no law abridging the freedom of the press and the freedom of speech. That is the very first article of the Bill of Rights. And it was first because it is first. It's the fundamental pillar of democratic society. Now here is Congress passing a law abridging the freedom of the press. Now I don't see what the devil the argument is. There is no argument. The Constitution didn't say Congress shall pass no law abridging the freedom of the press except for the Pike Committee report. <laughs> now the Founding Father said shall pass no law Period. And here's Congress in the bicentennial year celebrating the American Revolution in which it no longer believes, <laughs> passing a law abridging the freedom of the press. Now you may well say to me, well, for goodness sake, Sean Byrne, are you saying the press is free to do any damn fool thing it wants? Yes, that is exactly what I'm saying to you. You make no mistake about what I'm saying to you. The press can do any damn fool thing that it wants. Now you get that into your heads, and don't you forget it, ever forget it. Because the minute you forget it, you have said goodbye to the free United States of America. Well then you might say, Schoenberg, are you suggesting that the press is totally irresponsible? No, I am not. The press may be held responsible for its actions. For example, we have libel laws, don't we? You just can't slander a person so that the press may be punished after the fact, right? After the fact. The press may do something that seriously injures somebody, and that person in a free society should have redress. No question about it. But there shall be no prior restraint. Do you know what that legal phrase, prior restraint, means, my dear fellow Americans? It means censorship. It means you must not, anybody in government or any agency or any oil company or any damn thing at all, nobody must tell the press in advance what it may or may not publish. We must be free to publish what we think is news in our opinion. Now, we may be wrong. Oh, boy. We are often wrong. Jack can tell you, we make mistakes. But we can be held accountable for our mistakes. If a newspaper is consistently wrong, you're going to stop buying it. Advertisers will stop placing their copy in it. Television stations and radio stations are under regulation by the FCC. They can be called to account. They can lose their franchise. No, we are not irresponsible. We are responsible. We are held accountable. We should be held accountable for our actions. You've heard me talk about freedom and how devoted I am, but I am not an anarchist. I believe in law, I believe in order, but I do not believe in censorship. Censorship is the death of democracy, the death of this society. If we had not told the truth about the war in Vietnam, where would you be today? You'd all still be fighting that. If we had not told the truth about segregation and suppression of the rights of black people in the South, where would they be today? A lot worse off than they are, and God knows they're bad enough off even today. If we had not told the truth about Watergate, Richard Nixon would still be president of the United States, God help us all. <laughs> Spiro Agnew would still be vice president of the United States. What a hideous, nauseating thought. <laughs> Who in the world else is going to tell you the truth 
if not I, Jack, and fellows like us. Oh, I'm not pretending that we know the truth for goodness sakes in heaven. We can only try to tell you the truth as we discovered it, as we see it. Now, if Jack, as news director, had made a lot of mistakes, where was it, WHO? He wouldn't have been news director for 30 years. They should have fired you a long time ago. <laughs> oh, that, that, this is a man who's held a job for 30 years. You think he held it simply because uh, somebody liked him? He's not that handsome. <laughs> no, no, no. The fact is that he would have been fired had there been a lot of mistakes. Now, let's face it, Jack. A lot of errors, and they've got your neck pretty fast. Yeah. No question about it. You think I could have been a CBS correspondent in Paris and Washington for 20 years if I were lying or making mistakes? Forget it. I wouldn't last long. I wouldn't last long. Lots of guys get fired in our business. So that there are ways, short of censorship, to control the press. Now, the press does make mistakes. Really hideous and awful mistakes. Probably the worst mistake that I have seen in my career, maybe Jack, you have other examples, was what happened in World War II, when the Chicago Tribune <coughs> revealed that the United States intelligence community had broken the Japanese secret naval code. Remember that? The minute that the Chicago Tribune said that the Japanese had broken the naval code, the Japanese changed their code. Thousands of American lives and many American ships were lost because the Japanese were able to protect themselves. The Chicago Tribune seriously injured the United States of America. I don't think you'd describe the Chicago Tribune as a very liberal newspaper. So you see, right-wingers are capable of endangering the national security as much as left-wingers. In my opinion, much more so. That's my personal opinion. I could be wrong. They didn't suffer. Nothing happened to them. In other words, there is a price to be paid for freedom. When those people who are opposed to freedom of the press tell you that freedom of the press comes high, I admit it. I admit it. It does come high. Boy, when we make a serious mistake, it's very bad indeed. But what's the answer? Who the hell is going to control us? Who doesn't make mistakes? If you, perhaps, do not trust the press, just how much do you trust the Pentagon? You'd like them to control us? How much do you trust the FBI? How objective are they in the search for truth? Do you trust the CIA? Do you trust the White House? Do you trust the Congress? Do you trust John Stennis of Mississippi? I don't. I don't. In the absence of anybody more reliable than myself, I'll take my chances on me. And my record's pretty good compared to that of John Stennis, or J. Edgar Hoover, or for that matter, Gerald Ford. A point which I'm willing to argue about <laughs> later, which of course does not refer to the First Amendment. But you must ask yourself as American citizens, is there a valid, viable substitute to the freedom of the press? There is none. There is none. Do you think that a Secretary of State is going to call us all into a press conference one day and say, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> let me tell you of a big poo-poo that I made today. Mr. Kissinger is not about to do that. But Marvin Callum can do it in much better English. In fact, the foreign minister of Israel could do it in better English. <laughs> You've got to count upon a free press to inform you of what's happening in your government. Who else is going to do it? We're not perfect. I've admitted that. We make mistakes. I've admitted that. They make mistakes, and it's their job to cover it up. The State Department, the Pentagon, the CIA, FBI, the Commerce Department, not to mention the Department of Agriculture. 
I learned here in Ames today, I didn't know this because I've been traveling, that Pat Boone, one of the great intellects of America, <laughs> that Pat Boone said today, isn't it terrible that Earl Butts should lose his job for telling a story which reporters have told and are being paid for? How do you like that for reasoning? <laughs> Any country which can equate Earl Butts' obscenity about the fellow black citizens to a reporter repeating it is a country which seriously doubts the value of freedom of the press. That's an absolutely inconceivable notion in my mind. But it's not a surprising one. All through history, the messenger has been blamed for the message. Way back in the time of the ancient Greeks, when a runner arrived to announce to a leader a defeat, the leader said, chop off his head. That's what the American public is doing today to many reporters. All through the war in Vietnam, when I said that Johnson was lying and cheating, when I said that the war was being lost and American boys were dying needlessly as well as Vietnamese boys, people shouted in this country, chop off his head. They didn't want to hear the truth. That's why I said to you at the outset that I have very serious doubts about the commitment of the American people to democracy. I really do. Thank goodness there are many, and I hope there are many in this room, who are committed to democracy and who understand this. But the lesson of the Dan Shore case is fascinating. Dan Shore published on CBS, not published, but broadcast on CBS, a document that was free at the time he broadcast it, with no restrictions. Restrictions were later put on by the full house overruling the Pike Committee. And the full house said to the Pike Committee, you may not publish the report. At that point, they stamped it secret. Now, I ask you a question. Since Dan Shaw broadcast it before it was stamped secret, what was he guilty of? Absolutely nothing. The plot thickens when we come to the after. Because after it was stamped secret, Dan gave his copy of the report to the Village Voice. Aha, now he was guilty. Guilty of what? He was guilty of not accepting the House vote that the report be secret. Now you must ask yourself, did the House have the right to make its own report secret when that report was mandated politically and paid for financially by the American people who have a right to know what the CIA was doing? Dan Shore thought that the House did not have such a right. And he thought so on the basis of the First Amendment. Thou shalt pass no law abridging the freedom of the press. Now, the House can control itself. The House could well have held an investigation to find out themselves who in the House gave out the document. That they're perfectly free to do. But they are not free to ask Dan Shore to tell them. However, however, they subpoenaed Dan Shore, got him under oath, and asked him. Now they were involving a special congressional privilege. And that is Congress's right in the course of legislation to examine witnesses and to demand answers. That's a very important right of the Congress of the United States. And if you refuse to answer a question of the Congress of the United States, except by pleading the Fifth Amendment, that it may tend to incriminate you and no man is entitled, no man is obliged to testify against himself. If you plead the Fifth Amendment, you need not answer a question before the House. But Dan did not plead the Fifth Amendment. Dan said, I cannot answer the question. And when they said, Mr. Shore, we ask you again, would you give us the name of your informant? Or do you refuse to answer us? Dave, you know, Dan gave an answer which to me was very much in the spirit of Ben Franklin and our founding fathers. I was very proud of Dan, Dan Shore. He said, and some of you may have seen him and heard him on television, he said, I do not refuse to answer you. I cannot answer you. To answer you would be to betray my oath to my profession. I'm a reporter. I am sworn to defend my sources. 
When somebody speaks to me or gives me a document in confidence, I must protect them. For if I do not, and this has been argued for 200 years now, if I do not, if I reveal the nature of a source, if people know that their names will be turned over to the government for what they say, they will not speak to the press. Many of you have read the book, All the President's Men by Woodward and Bernstein. Probably more of you have seen the movie than have read the book. And if you've seen the movie, how many have seen the movie? Oh, almost all of you. If you've seen, how many have read the book? Hey, terrific. That's a university. Yeah. Great, I forgot I was at a university. That's wonderful. Well, then you know how reluctant those people were to talk to Woodward and Bernstein. They had to have absolute assurances from Woodward and Bernstein that the names would not be used. Otherwise, they would not have talked. If they had not talked, Woodward and Bernstein wouldn't have found out what they found out, and Nixon would probably be president of the United States. That and the tapes, of course. Now, you must understand, then, that confidentiality of source is not some minor, insignificant, technical, repertorial term. It is the essence of my profession. If we cannot speak to people without them fearing that they will become witnesses in the government or their names be turned over to the government, which is the essence of a police state, they won't speak to us. If they don't speak to us, that's the end of reporting because 90% of our valid information, of our most exciting information, does not come from government handouts. Government handouts tell us what the government has done that is right. And they should do that, and I'm glad to know. But no government tells you what is wrong. What is wrong is told to you in secret by somebody in government who's patriotic but distressed and unhappy about the mistake of his boss and who tells you in order to clear it up. If we can't do that, we cannot function. And if we cannot function, you have lost your most precious freedom because you'll no longer know what's happening in your country. This is what this debate is all about. I am not certain that the American people understand it because wherever I go, I hear the most outrageous charges. The press is biased, the press is partisan. I cannot believe my ears when I travel through the country and have people say to me, now you gotta admit, that Walter Cronkite is very left-wing. <laughs> Walter's a good friend of mine. I think he's one of the great technicians of American television. I love Walter Cronkite. I think he's right-wing. I may be wrong, but I mean left-wing? Unreal, absolutely unreal. People who say to me, did you see the way Brinkley lifted his eyebrow the other day? <laughs> I just hear, yeah, and really, since Agnew's attack upon the press, we've suffered very terribly. Now, in this Dan Shore case, a lot of people said, Dan Shore had no right to give it to the Village Voice. It was a secret document. Now, you'll make up your own mind. You know what my opinion is. The House has a right to police itself. It does not have a right to police the press. Dan Shore didn't have to pay any attention to the House vote and Dan Shore paid no attention, and what happened when he made his presentation before the House and refused? Six members of the Ethics Committee agreed with Dan Shore, and no charges were pressed. Dan Shore won his case. To be sure, he has since resigned from CBS, but believe me, that has nothing to do with the principle of freedom of the press. He resigned from CBS because Dan is a very difficult fellow. He was involved in very stern and rough, tough competition with his fellow reporters. He has said in public at Duke University some things that angered Eric Severide, Dan Rather, Mike Wallace. He was critical of his colleagues. Uh, I won't go into it in detail, but his behavior during this whole affair led to a suspicion to fall upon Leslie Stahl, and they thought she stole it. And in fact, it was Dan who stole it. And finally, Dan, Dan said he didn't steal it, so they thought Leslie did. Finally, Dan said he did, but by that time, Leslie was under a cloud, and now Leslie's furious with him, and Leslie's friends won't talk to Dan. Forget it. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, you know, I didn't say Dan was a saint. On the issue of freedom of the press, the House decided not to cite him for contempt. Did that end the question? Not at all. 
the principle of law was not decided. The only thing that was decided, if anything was decided at all, really, is that a precedent was established which will make it very difficult for the House in the future to investigate any reporter for the same alleged violation. And here, I was fairly proud of my fellow citizens because a great many, at this point, members of the press and members of the public expressed sympathy for Dan Shore and the Congress, finally, by a very narrow vote, huh? six to six. Not a rousing cheer for democracy, but by a vote of six to six, a deadlock cleared Dan Shore. But it leaves intact the question of law. Now, I want to discuss with you the question of law. There are many cases involved about the status of law. And the most important case goes back, I guess it's about, yes, four years. And that's the case of Brandsburg versus Hayes. If you want to look it up in your encyclopedia here at the college, I think you'll be excited by it. Brandsburg versus Hayes, four years ago. That was a case, that's the Supreme Court title of the case. Look up Supreme Court decisions for 1972 and you'll find Brandsburg versus Hayes. In that case, three reporters had been cited for contempt of a grand jury for refusing to answer questions. In those three cases, one was the most important of the three. And that was the case, you may recall, of a reporter named Caldwell, Earl Caldwell of the New York Times. Earl Caldwell had interviewed Black Panther leaders, had quoted them on their grievances, on their threats of taking action, on their threats against law and order, on their boasts of many of their deeds. And a grand jury investigating crime and particularly violent crime by the Black Panthers particularly, called Earl Caldwell, said we want the names and we want your notebook and we want all the details of this interview. Earl Caldwell said no, won't give it to you. Confidentiality, First Amendment. They cited him for contempt and found him guilty and they tossed him into jail, different from the Shore case. He fought it to the Supreme Court. And they laid down their decision in Brandsburg versus Hayes, which I've told you to look up. And in Brandsburg versus Hayes, by a vote of five to four, very narrow majority in the Supreme Court, huh? by a vote of five to four, decided that the First Amendment did not protect the reporter in every single instance, and certainly not before the necessity of testifying to a grand jury. Now that's fascinating. The Supreme Court in many cases has taken this position in one set of circumstances and not in another. And why did they do it in this case? Because the Supreme Court wants to uphold the sanctity and integrity of the judicial system in the United States. The Supreme Court might vote against the Congress. The Supreme Court might vote against an oil company. The Supreme Court might vote against an attorney general of a civil case. But when it comes to a judicial case and a grand jury, the Supreme Court decides that the grand jury is more important than the First Amendment. Now, that's a very interesting idea, and the Supreme Court so decided. But I must tell you that in this decision of five to four, one of the five, that's interesting, one of the majority justices wrote a concurring opinion. A concurring opinion is a fuller explanation by a justice of a decision in which he takes a somewhat different point of view from the other justices while still concurring, whereas a dissenting opinion is the minority who votes against the majority. But a concurring opinion is a majority opinion from a different point of view. And this majority opinion, interestingly enough, was written by a very conservative justice, Mr. Lewis Powell. And Mr. Justice Lewis Powell said that the First Amendment is not, as the majority claimed, an absolute protection and privilege of the press in all cases. However, it is a very powerful one, he said, 
and the reporter should be forced to answer questions only when and if the grand jury presented an outstanding case of legitimate concern for the legal process. In other words, the grand jury must first prove that this information is vital. If they prove it's vital, then the reporter must answer. But you see, Mr. Justice Powell changed that five to four decision to a four to five decision. He's saying now, in a four to five decision, that the First Amendment is a powerful deterrent, not an absolute one, but a powerful one. And only in very limited cases can the First Amendment be overturned. So I think that by and large, the Supreme Court still comes down on the side of the press, in defense of the press. I would still plead the First Amendment if I were asked to answer questions, and I think I would win based on Mr. Powell's thought that they must make a powerful case against me. Now, if they do make a powerful case against me, I suppose I'd have to go to jail. Now, what happens when you go to jail? We've seen that in the recent case of four newsmen of the Fresno B, wasn't it? Fresno B. They refused to answer questions of the grand jury. The grand jury said that their answers were absolutely essential. They still refused to answer questions. They went to jail. Three weeks later, four weeks later, however long it was, the judge called them back and said, now, gentlemen, you've been in jail. When are you going to get ready to answer the question? They said, Your Honor, never. We are prepared to stay in jail for the rest of our lives to overhold, over uphold this principle of American democracy. We'll give up our lives for it. And the judge said, OK, you're free men. He let them go, saying, what's the point of trying to punish them as though they were criminals? These are fine Americans. The purpose of the jail sentence was to make them talk. If they won't talk, it doesn't work, and we'll release them. That, ladies and gentlemen, for me, was a triumph for the judicial system. And although I began my talk by telling you how pessimistic I was about the continuation of American democracy, how I have seen clearly its deterioration, I end my talk by telling you that despite this fact, I am optimistic about the American system, for it has shown itself capable of correcting if I am pessimistic, it is because there are great anti-democratic forces that are loose in this country. If I am optimistic, it is because there are great democratic forces loose in this country. Which will win? I do not know. I am not a prophet. I only know one thing. You will decide it, for you are the generation coming to power. Good luck to you. Good luck to America. And thanks for letting me come here and speak to you about this subject tonight. David, I think you have your answer as to your reception already. But let's uh, sort of throw you to the wolves or throw them to you, whichever way it works out. And you have said you're willing to take questions. Uh, will you, as you ask your questions, uh, please try to speak in a uh, fashion that will allow you to be heard throughout the room. If there's any doubt in your mind, David, about it, please repeat the question. I'll repeat. All right. Who's going to be the first? Did you all hear the question? That's a marvelous question. I wish the hell you hadn't asked it. <laughs> but I will try to cope with it. Uh, you know, I've had an experience at your school already this afternoon with the journalism class where I've really heard more intelligent questions one afternoon than I've heard in New York City in a week. And um, I, uh, your question is marvelous. Should the paper have taken upon itself the decision 
not to publish. In other words, you're raising a very important question. Should we indulge in self-censorship? Could not self-censorship be as inimical as censorship? Because through misguided notions of patriotism, we could suppress information. And in fact, we have done that on many occasions. The most famous occasion relating to your question, which I will answer, I'm not ducking, but I want to give you background. The most famous ca question came when certain reporters of the New York Times, certain reporters of the New York Times discovered that we were planning an invasion of the Bay of Pigs in Cuba. And it came to the chief correspondent, Scotty Reston, and Scotty Reston, a reliable, professional, first-rate guy, consulting only his immediate colleagues, and not the government, knowing what the government's answer would be if he'd raised the question, you know, shut up. But consulting himself only, Scotty decided that it was the patriotic thing to do, not to reveal this, because if he revealed it, he would abort it. And if he aborted it, he might be stopping something very important. He didn't know whether it was right or whether it was wrong. He couldn't make up his mind. And he figured as a patriot, he'd better not reveal the secret plans of the American government. Scotty didn't reveal it. The Bay of Pigs went on. One of the worst failures, one of the worst catastrophes in American diplomatic and foreign military history. Much later on, Jack Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, our president, said to Scotty, oh my God, Scotty, you dumbbell. Why didn't you publish that story? You'd have saved me from a terrible mistake. To which Scotty said, had I done so, what would you have said about me at the time? <laughs> Kenny said, I'd thrown you into jail and probably had you shot. <laughs> Scotty now regrets that he didn't tell the story, which means that we oughtn't, to answer your question, second guess ourselves. Now, to get you the question specifically, what should the Chicago Tribune have done? <coughs> well, they could have consulted the government, but why bother? You know, if you tell the government, I know that you've done this, should I say so, they'll kidnap you, and that's the end of that. <laughs> but what you're really asking me is, should the Chicago Tribune have taken it upon itself to make this decision or said, let the American people decide? That's really what's at stake. I reply to you that despite my devotion to total freedom, I would not have published that report because I have a commonsensical rule of my own. Now, it may be wrong. I don't really you know, defend myself. As Benjamin Franklin said about the Constitution of the United States, I don't really like it very much, but I don't think we can get a better one. Besides, the older I get, the less inclined I am to trust my own judgments. And I feel precisely the same way as, as Ben Franklin did. I think that we must learn humility, and if we're not going to learn in our old age, that's our last chance to learn it. Um, I would not have published it for one reason. My rule of thumb is I will publish everything that the public has a right to know which affects the health and strength of my society. Now, in what way does a knowledge of the Japanese naval code protect my society and give my fellow citizens information about their government that they absolutely must know? For example, if I knew that troops were being shipped on a certain day to a garrison in Germany, would I publish the date? Would I publish a map for Soviet submarines to look at? No, I just plain wouldn't do it. If I discovered, however, that my government was sending troops to Germany without the consent of the Congress of the United States, I would publish it. I would say the United States is about to send troops to Germany, they shouldn't do so. But I would not say on Tuesday at 11 o'clock. <laughs> so all I suggest to you is a commonsensical rule, with very few exceptions to freedom of the press. One of those exceptions being the date and place of a troop movement, the blueprint of a new weapon, something that is, in my mind, truly secret. I'm going to have to make up my mind myself. I can't ask anybody's advice. Yes, sir. Uh, how do you feel about the suppression of third-party candidates by the media? I feel by the media, or do you mean by the ballot? Well, like McCarthy not being able to Well, McCarthy's being suppressed not only by the media, but in New York they're challenging the validity of his signatures and trying to keep him off the ballot. 
<laughs> You're going to think I'm some kind of a nut when I answer this question. I have, two, I have two feelings about it. It's absolutely disgraceful. Two, I thoroughly endorse it. <laughs> what do you want me to tell you? Theoretically, all these other candidates have a right to appear. Practically, they confuse the situation. Listen, we have a hard enough time picking between the two dumbbells who are already running for the major parties without having 12 weirdos join it. And for in my book, my friend Gene McCarthy is a new weirdo. And in addition to Gene McCarthy, the other weirdos. So if you put me up against it as a man of principle, I think they should have equal attention and they should all be on the ballot. But I am not a saint. And although I'm a principled man, I think I'm a man of integrity and I'm profoundly democratic, I think they're lousing up the democratic process. Gene McCarthy hasn't got any much more chance of being elected president than I have. In fact, I think I've got a better chance than Gene McCarthy. I mean it, I've got more friends in this country than Gene McCarthy. <laughs> but if Gene McCarthy goes on that ballot in New York State, according to the present polls, there is a four point difference between Ford and Carter. Carter's running four points ahead in New York. Gene McCarthy will get 6% of the vote. And Ford will win New York over Carter only because of Gene McCarthy, who's a spoiler. So, I shall defend to the death their right to be on the ballot and represented in the media. And I hope we heard the last of the rascals. <laughs> I'm not being contradictory. I'm telling you from the bottom of my heart and a really honest answer. Yes? There was somebody in the back, too. I'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah, green in the back. Yes. Uh, and regarding the point about uh, the explanation published in, in October and November of 1960 that was going to go on, right. the Times wasn't being president. But the, the, the question that I have for you is on another matter. That is, why, if, in order to get certain reforms in Congress, must we find uh, laws being practiced by congressmen before we can move them off this, move the Congress off this? Well, any reason for moving a congressman out of office is perfectly good. And Mr. Wilbur Mills did not practice lust in his heart, he practiced lust in his pants. <laughs> That's more serious. <laughs> Furthermore, the girl he lusted after jumped into the bay in public. You couldn't ignore it. Now, I don't think that's the only way we should move, remove congressmen. I agree with you. Furthermore, I think you've raised a very legitimate point. That same ethics committee, which was set up to police the ethics of the Congress of the United States, never took action against anybody but Daniel Shore <laughs> in their whole mandate. You're right. There ought to be better ways to police the Congress than some sexual peccadillo of a silly old man. I agree with you. Yes, sir. That's, a, that's an excellent question, too. Do I accept the request of one of my sources to whom I'm speaking that his name not only be withheld, principle of confidentiality, but when he says to me, it's off the record, what do I say? I tell him, you cannot speak to me off the record. I will listen to nothing off the record. I will listen confidentially, but not off the record. There's a big difference. Confidentially means I will not reveal who told me. I will not attribute it. But off the record is the best way to tie me up as a reporter. Off the record is censorship. And I've told this to the Secretary of State. I have walked out of press conferences in the State Department when the spokesman got up and said, gentlemen, the next five minutes are off the record. I get up and walk out. Why? Because whatever he tells me, I can probably find out on the record from somebody else. <laughs> the minute I listen to him off the record, he shut my mouth. Now, the best way to suppress the press is to tell them everything off the record. Your question is excellent. I will not speak to a single news source off the record and never have in my entire career. Yes, sir? Oh, yes. Of course. Absolutely. The first thing I say when I sit down with a news source is, is this on the record, attributable, or confidential, deep background? Which, which way is it? Yeah, we discuss that immediately. Oh, not when I go to lunch with a friend of mine. We don't discuss it that way. But in the course of a luncheon, I assume that he knows that anything he tells me, I'm going to repeat. <laughs> He'd better watch himself. I mean, you talk to me, I'm a sieve. 
And the guy says to me, Jesus, Dave, what the hell did you do? I said, you told it to me. He said, yeah, but we were at lunch. I said, I don't care whether at lunch or in bed. You tell me something. <laughs> you tell me something, I'm going to repeat it. But if at lunch a friend of mine in the course of briefing me says, hey, Dave, and this is off the record, I say, Jack, save it. If it's off the record, keep your little secret. I don't want to know it. Yes, it is discussed. And if it's not discussed in advance, I assume everything is on the record. It's up to him to tell me it's not. Not up to me. Yes, sir. Libel law. Well, I would, uh, not the libel law, I agree with the text, but the uh, dropping of advertising from newspapers. I'd ask, ask you, how many licenses have been canceled? And how many press have gone out because of but you're right, that is not a major threat, the threat of a cancellation of franchise. It's one of many. There are many, many other devices that government uses that I haven't even talked about. But the fact is, I know of no way to um, control the press and make it more responsible other than by its own standards of reliability. If you do, if anybody else does, I'd like to hear it. There is no way. There's nobody I trust more than the press itself. I can't imagine a czar of the press, like a czar of baseball, to be omnipotent and objective at all times. Not that the czar of baseball is. <laughs> yes, sir. Have the uh, League of Women Voters ground rules for the debates emasculated their purpose during these debates? Oh, well, you've overstated your question, I think. I think the League of Women Voters format has weakened their case. But I mean, to say that the women are emasculating us all is going pretty far. There are many emasculators in the League of Women Voters, to be sure, as there are in the women's uh, lib movement. But no, I would not agree that they've emasculated. I think that the format is wrong. I think it's stiff. I think it vitiates the question. And in fact, I think in one sense that it not only emasculates, I'll go further than you, it annuls the meaning of a debate. These gentlemen are not having a debate. They're having a mutual meet the press conference. Not a debate at all. I think it's most unfortunate. The question was, was mostly directed to the panel uh, whether Reynolds, uh, Drew, and Gannon were actually able to function as journalists under that, that spotlight, that mega event of the first Oh, week. yeah. I think we journalists can function that way. I thought, I don't know about what you thought, I thought their questions were pretty darn good. And I also thought, given a chance to have a follow-up question, which they got a lot tougher in the second question, that, I think that was pretty good. If anybody was emasculated, it was not the journalists, it was Ford and Carter, because they were in a wooden format, responding, but not debating. It's not a good format, you and I can agree on that. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's another question about the licensing system. The licensing system is an inimical one, but I don't know any way out. Uh, it has been felt that radio and television are semi-monopolies. That there are, the reason for that is there is no limit, in theory, on the number of newspapers that can be printed. You know, there's enough paper, there's enough ink, there's enough linotypes. But there are not enough wavelengths. So there's a limit to how many radio and television stations can actually broadcast. The band is not unlimited. Because there is such a limit, it's a semi-monopoly. Because it's a semi-monopoly, it comes under government regulation. And this government regulation, which has proved to be fairly innocuous, in fact, the FCC has more been the servant of the industry than the critic of the industry. But you're quite right. It could work the other way around. It could conceivably, under a strong-minded autocratic president put forth a set of rules and investigations which could terrify the stations and, and impose censorship. It could, you're absolutely right, it could turn out that way. So far, it has not. That's no protection, but that's the situation in which we find ourselves. Yes, sir.
Oh, that's, a, that's again a wonderful and very difficult question to answer. Why is it if we teach this in school, it has not entered the consciousness of all Americans so that they become fundamentally democratic? That's your question. I think you learn things at school on one level, and you learn them in life at another level. Life is a tremendous struggle. People have very great difficulties. When you get a vested interest in your job or in an industry, most people, after, within a few years after school, become motivated not politically, but economically. Economically, we have become, in many respects, an extremely conservative, capitalistic, indeed oligarchic country. And even those who are not oligarchs or capitalists in some curious way identify with them. There has been a growing tendency towards conservatism in this country. And it grows out of many complex factors. You can be in principle in favor of democracy, but when you see what you consider to be anarchy in your streets, when you see violent crimes and dope, when you see the growth of a welfare program which is sapping your taxes, when you're told by responsible officials that these welfare people are cheats, that they're not unfortunates, but they're cheats, that they don't even want to work, your, your, your gorge rises. I can understand that the welfare system and the crime system in America has convinced a large part of the American middle class that they are hardworking, that they are decent, and they're taxpaying, and they're getting screwed, and that, by God, it's all this democracy which is screwing them. I think that's the answer to the question. And that's a much stronger impact upon people than theoretic questions of democracy in political science classes. What can we do about the 475,000 people, the bureaucrats in government, the mad stampers who put a secret label? Tell me about the CIA. Oh, sure, the mad stampers in every government bureau, the toilet paper division, classified toilet paper division. We have them in the agriculture department, we have them in the post office, we have them everywhere. What can we do about them? What I'm doing tonight, you resist them. You talk against them. And as a reporter, you pay no attention to them. You violate their stamps. For example, do you know who the biggest violator of secrecy in the United States government is? The United States government. You should see my desk. I've got more damn secret papers on my desk mailed to me by the United States government. They leak what they want to leak. And what you do, and what I do, is not only talk against it in public, I write to my congressman, I ask him to try to put through legislation to remove secrecy. Congress has investigated, you know. Do you know congressional investigations have revealed that more than 95% of all so-called classified documents should not have been classified at all. But Congress doesn't have the guts to pass a law about this. And all I can do is to try to talk to my congressman. All you can do is to do the same or run for Congress yourself and do something about it. Are you going to vote? Attaboy. Or if you're going to participate, how many of you are going to vote? Oh, that's terrific. You know, I asked my class at the New School of Social Research, and half of them did not raise their hands. They're fed up, absolutely disgusted. And there's no more danger to democracy than disgust. You turn your back upon your country and you've given it up. I, I don't know how to fight them other than the simple ways that I'm telling you. I have to take one more. Just one follow-up question. Sure. Now, you have 478,000 people that are classified. How many people do you have that are declassified? Oh, almost none. Very few. Declassification is a, is a, a figment just a little nothing of all of the classified papers. But I tell you that 90% 90, 90 of the classified papers are ignored. So the whole thing is some kind of a gigantic game anyway. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to have visited with you again. Good luck to you. May your favorite candidate win. May I make one announcement before we adjourn? Uh, next Thursday evening, a good friend of David's, Elmer Lauer, the Vice President of ABC News, will be talking in Lush Auditorium 
uh, on the subject of television coverage of the presidential election campaigns, a joint program of the University Lectures Committee and the Department of Journalism. 8 p.m. next Thursday, we hope you'll be there. And David, we thank you so very much. Good night.